Today is February 20th, 2012. Uh, my name is Joe Bruckner. I'm a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center in Atlanta, Georgia. And with me is Tony Hilliard, who is also a volunteer with the Atlanta History Center. And we're honored to have with us today Mr. Tom Harris. Okay. Uh, Mr. Harris is a native Atlantan and a veteran of the Korean War. And he's agreed to come in and tell us his story in connection with the Library of Congress Veteran History Project. Mr. Harris, thank you very much for coming in, and again, we're honored to have you here today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. Could you give us your full name and current address, please? My full name is Thomas Copy Harris, but I'm no more junior. My father died, so I had his name. Okay. But my address here, Smyrna, Georgia. And that's not too far away. Okay. Where and when were you born? I was born in Atlanta, Georgia, July 6, 1929, okay. right after the Depression. Okay. <laughs> Whenever that was. <laughs> Please tell us a little bit about your upbringing. Well, I was brought up in West End in Atlanta, Georgia, on Oak Street, which was real near the Wren's Nest which was Joel Allen Harris' home. He's not my cousin that I know of. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I went to J.C. Harris School as a young kid, five years old and up. And it was very interesting because it had a library with the pictures, art pictures of the animals shown in the book. The Joel Chandler Harris books? Joel Chandler Harris book uh, about the box and the rabbit and the yeah. man who was telling the story. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, that's where I grew up. Went to grammar school there for six years and then went to Brown Junior High School and we, I left there in the, I think it was in the ninth grade. Now, then I went to Boys High School for one semester. At that time, it was a long distance a long way from where I lived. So I asked my parents if I could move to a closer school, possibly in College Park, named Georgia Military Academy. And so they finally got convinced it was closer and better, and so I got to go to Georgia Military Academy as a youngster around 15 or so. I can't remember. But I was about 15, and uh, I had to learn a lot because I hadn't been in the military school much didn't know much about their routine, but I learned it pretty quick because I had to wear a uniform. Yeah. And after I was told what we were going to do, then I caught on to it. It took me about four or five months to get involved in the military, but it was a learning situation, and I, I was happy to be there. And uh, I had some good professors who just returned from World War II, oh. and they were very direct. They didn't waste time telling you what they were going to say. Really? <laughs> no. And uh, so Bill Curry was one of my teachers in math, and he turned that physical ed teacher as well. He, he was a lifter, and he's the only man I've seen to lift 400 pounds up over his head. <laughs> he, he was strong. Yeah. But I went out for track. I ran track in uh, GMA. Two years. I didn't run my senior year. I ran first two years. Okay. But I learned a lot about uh, getting into something that you can participate in. Yeah. So it made me more interested in what was going on. Okay. Did it cause you to be interested in eventually going into the military? After a good while. I didn't know much about what went on in the military until I had learned more and. Yeah entered some other okay. scopes, you know. Okay. First of all, I didn't know how to shoot a weapon when yeah. I was going to gym. I didn't, I didn't know anything about rifle shooting or whatever. I hadn't done that. Yeah. So I had to learn from scratch growing up. Okay. So anyway, I got some encouragement from some men who said they were going to go to the academies. 
They said, we're going to the academy. And I said, well, what for? What do you want to do there? They said, well, we've got a lot to learn. We can become an a Army officer or, an, or Marine or a Navy officer. I said, well, good luck. <laughs> I said, I think I'm going to go to a college in the state. Yeah. So after I graduated from uh, Georgia military, I uh, got in touch with someone at the University of Georgia named Dean Tate. <laughs> he was a former GMA student. I said, well, I think he recommended I come up there. I said, he, he didn't even require me to take an entrance exam. He said, just go on in, get ready. <laughs> I said, that was interesting. <laughs> so I got into that, and uh, I lived in a private home when I went to the university because it was full of veterans from World War II okay. in 1947. Wow. And uh, so I stayed in a home of the relatives that let me rent a oh. room there. And they were friends of my family, so I didn't have a problem with them. Okay. They were very, very nice. Yeah. The only thing was a little far from the campus. So in, in my junior year, uh, I got into a fraternity. And it was close to the school mm -hmm. and more compatible than the old folks who were living in the house I was at. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. A little more fun. <laughs> more fun, yeah. <laughs> so I enjoyed it more. And good. I think that was a good deal of the cost. I had to find out a lot about what the other ones were doing. Yeah. in the midst of the school training. Right. So anyway, I was majoring in, uh, the first year I majored in uh, forestry. And uh, I learned a lot about wood, but learned a lot about trees, but I found out this, that I wanted to know more about business, so I transferred and went to business school. Okay. And I attended that for the next three and a half years. And I, at the same time I entered Georgia, I didn't have to take the, the second year of military because I already had a credit from Jim. Oh, okay. And uh, I went three years in the ROTC program. And they had two branches. They had the infantry and the armor, and they put me in the armor branch. So I ended up in the armor branch. Okay. So after the graduation came, and when did you graduate? What year? Graduated in uh, 52 okay. in the fall semester, okay. 1952. And uh, okay. right after that, I uh, got a commission in the USA. I guess it was a commission in the USAR. I don't know what it was. But the Army, Army Reserve? Army Reserve, I think it was. But they sent me. They gave me 30 or 60 days. I said, I'll take 60 days before reporting to Fort Benning, Georgia. And I went to the 773rd Tank Battalion in Fort Benning, Georgia in March of 53. Had you had relatives who had served in the military? One uncle. Okay. Uncle Albert was a <clears throat> World War I and II veteran. Oh. He had a lieutenant colonel and yeah. judge advocate. And uh, he encouraged me to go ahead and <clears throat> do my <clears throat> duty for whatever time it was set up for. And he said, you'll do better with that. Yeah. <clears throat> but he didn't recommend that I go into Judge Evans. Right. Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> I wasn't a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I went on in uh, Fort Benning and I was assigned to attack the time. And I had a platoon of people who, some were sergeants and some of them were corporals. One, we had about three corporals or four, but two sergeants maybe. <clears throat> we didn't have a lot of high ranks. I think a lot of them had been taken overseas during the during Korean War. Yeah. My company commander had been in the Korean War. Okay. <clears throat> Pardon me. <clears throat> but he was a, he was a, RA, regular army. Okay. And so he was there for possibly six months while I was there and he got transferred over to somewhere in Italy. Uh, yeah. 
TRUSD, whatever that is, I don't know. Trust? I'm, I'm not sure it either. might have been in Yugoslavia, Paul. I, yeah. I don't know where it was. Okay. Anyway, I learned a lot there, <clears throat> but I learned a lot about finding out what else I can do. And uh, so I had to be, I served on the staff on weekends, and they gave me a little extra things to do, which meant you don't go out of town, you stay there all the yeah. weekend and everything. So yeah. I learned a little bit about the situation of rotation and so forth. Yeah. But uh, <clears throat> came the time came in uh, October of 53 that they gave me 30 days off that I was preparing to be sent to Korea. Okay. So I said, well, Am I restricted? They say, no, you can go anywhere you want to go so long as you report on time. So I got my orders in, uh, in the mail, and it said I should report to California in an aircraft for an aircraft trip out. So it was, I believe it was called Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I got a, I had a plane ticket. Somehow I got a plane ticket, and I went from Atlanta to Chicago, and from Chicago to Travis Air Base. We got, oh, four or five days stay there. This was in December. Next thing I know, I was in Tokyo, Japan. Wow. <laughs> we went by Air, US, US Air Force, across the Pacific, and we landed on Wake Island in December, and it was just like summertime. It was probably now, had you been, had, so you had been at Fort Benning and yeah. Fort Knox, or just Fort Benning? Well, I had, yeah, I had uh, six weeks training at Fort Knox. Okay. This this was a space between uh, June and uh, August. Okay. And I, I went back to Fort Benning I got you. after training in Fort Knox. You're right. I overlooked to tell you that I had armor training in Fort Knox and I was sent back to Fort Benning. Okay. Okay. Within a month, uh, probably by October, they said, you're going okay. on leave. And uh, next thing I know, I'm on the way in December. That, that's true. Okay. okay, once I got to Tokyo, it was Christmas time. Huh. It was Christmas Eve, here was Christmas. So I stayed I stayed in Tokyo for six days, and then they sent us down to Sasebo on a train. And we had to wait on a ship at Sasebo. And so we got to assemble right at the port, and stayed in barracks there until the ship came, and they picked us up on the uh, buses and took us to the side of the ship, and we mounted, we mounted the ship with bags and we were on our way to Korea, okay. across the uh, bay or whatever, the Japanese sea, mm -hmm. sea of sea Japan. Japan. Yeah. And we got to Korea on the day before New Year's. We got to Korea the day before New Year's at Incheon. And the, yeah. the, port, the port had enough water for us to dismount and go into a uh, Flat boat, whatever they call it. Uh, flat boat. Landing flat, craft or something? Flat, flat landing craft, go over to the uh, base, to the base uh, where we got out. And they put us in a transfer, what do they call it? A new, new barracks oh. where people come in for transfer. Yeah. So we stayed in there for about two days, which is very dull and very cold too. Yeah. Snow was on the ground. Yeah, there's been a lot said and written about the weather in Korea. Is, is it as bad as well, we hear? It was like uh, January is cold in Korea, very cold, and it had snow on the ground. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I noticed when I got out on the ground, the snow was all around mm -hmm. in places where it was bogged on grass, so it was held up, there was a lot of snow about it. Yeah. And so we walked on into the uh, transfer, I guess you call it replacement, mm -hmm. shipment barracks. And there we stayed, but I stayed under the blanket a lot because it was real cold. Yeah. It was 
down about uh, 15, 20 degrees. Wow. So we we got in there, and the next thing I know, then after we found out where we were going, they gave us some orders, and this was probably about the fourth day of uh, January. They said, you're going out to the 25th Infantry Division. You know, two or three others, we all got on a, a truck, and it took us to another point. Then we got out, and then they said, those of you going to this division, get on this one, and that division, get on that one, and the other one. And so I got on with two men in a jeep who were going to the same division I was going in, and they, they were like one captain and one first lieutenant. And I was the second lieutenant. So we we went off into the mountains, which was up in the mountains where we were going. And, uh, they took us to this uh, transfer point where they issued jackets and cold weather gear and uh, boots and uh, gloves and things yeah. like that. So. It was wind blowing like crazy. I mean, it was about zero up there almost. I mean, it was around 15 degrees. So we got out at this point. It was a transfer point, and I had to go in the tent. The tent didn't have any doors at either end. It was like wind blowing through it. So I got in with a sleeping, uh, what do you call it, a sleeping bag made out of, with uh, feathers in it. Oh, very good. Well, with a bag, yeah. and I pulled that thing up with all my clothes on. <laughs> <laughs> and got in the next morning, daybreak. I got up, and said, "Let's get that jeep going. Let's go." Get out of here. <laughs> so we end up at the Twenty Fifth Division headquarters, <clears throat> and uh, they kept. They saw us after eight o'clock in the morning. We got coffee somewhere because it's been very cold out there. And uh, they kept interviewing all of them that came in, and I got in line. They, now here you are, you're in armored. Where do you want to go? I said, I want to go to the armored battalion. He said, Oh well. And they looked at the disc, pulled the list out, said, There's no more spaces in there for, for a lieutenant. They all taken. So what else have you got? I said, We got the 35th Infantry Regiment Tank Company. I said, Well, send me there then. <laughs> <clears throat> so that's, they said, that's where we already were sending you. So that's where you're going. So I went down there and uh, it was, they were all in place. I mean, they all had tents and behind the line. They went up on the line. And so I went in, I said, it's dark down here. I said, by the time we got there from the other point, it was nighttime. It was, you know, about six or seven o'clock. So I said, well, I want to go to the, nearest company you can find. <laughs> they put me out in med company. Med? Like M medical company. Medical company. And so the medical company was holding a meeting. And so I said, I'm going in there. It's nice and warm. I'll just go in there. I sat in the back row and there was my brother-in-law up in the front. <laughs> and you had no idea he was going to be there? <laughs> I knew he was somewhere, but I didn't know he was there. Gee. He was a doctor. And I said, I won't say anything. I sat at the back row when the meeting broke up. I just waved at him. I said, hello, John. How are you tonight? <laughs> he said, what are you doing here? I said, I'm reporting in. He said, you're not a doctor. What are you doing here? I said, I'm going over to the armored company. <laughs> and I'm, I said, well, wh where is it? I said, I don't know where it is. It's dark here. He said, well, maybe somebody up here will know where it is and can take you there. So he got a jeep, a jeep that knew which way to go, and they took me to the armor company, and I got there about 8.30 at night. <laughs> it's sort of a funny thing, but they were nice guys. I mean, they were all playing a card game or something. I went in and told them I was reporting, and I said, if you don't mind, I'd like to put my bag down have a seat if you don't mind when you let me do that. They said, come right in, just sit it down. Good. Come on, get in the game if you want to. And I said, okay. But the man who was the company commander was World War II vet, a captain huh. from Indiana. His name was Captain Gaby. And uh, he's a nice guy. And he said, well, I'll find you a bunk. 
just don't get in a hurry. I said, I'll have to get you one that's not occupied. I said, okay. So they already had about three other, about four other officers there. So they had to find a place for me to stay in. It's a big enough tent, so. He told me I was going to take over the, the platoon that was up on the mountain. And I said, well, I guess when I get up there, they'll, they won't know me. And he said, well, I'll give you an introduction when you get there. So I, I went up in the positions on the line, had five tanks in a row up on a line dug in. And uh, <clears throat> so I met the infantry commander of the infantry company. And he said, you'll be bunking with me. We'll be in the same tent. And he, he was a captain. and. Uh, Decent fellow. He'd been in training at Fort Banning and everything. Yeah. So he told me about the situation. I said, well, I'm going to be able to find out from you what's going on up here. And he said, well, I'll clue you in. I said, we're right beside each other. Okay. See, so the infantry dug in underground out there. Oh. Okay. You, could, you could see out through these, what we call railroad, railroad ties, ties yeah. that was built so they could have a slot to look out, but they were guarded by all the ground above it. Okay. And I said, well, I'd like to take a look during daylight. And they showed me down there, and I had a sergeant up there already <clears throat> who was a big tall guy, and he wasn't long before leaving. And he said he was glad to see some new person come. He said, we've been here a good time, and he said he's ready to go. Yeah. He said his tour was up, and uh, he was there for about two or three weeks, and then he left. Was the tour a year? Was that the, the length of the tour? Well, the, the tour I had up there with the with the 25th Infantry lasted from January through August, okay. so it was about seven months. But they were transferring the 25th Infantry to Vision Al. It, okay. it was sent to Hawaii. Yeah. And what happened to me is that I had two company commanders, but in the meanwhile, they said, you have a choice to spend one more year in Hawaii or you can stay here. Yeah. I said, I'm staying here. Yeah. <laughs> when, you, when you were in this location, about how far were you from the, the enemy? As far as you knew, four thousand yards. Okay. More or less. Okay. But we couldn't see the enemy. I mean, they were too far away. But we were way up on a ridge. Okay. And there were two rivers right below us. The Amgen River had a fork in it. Two rivers just forked together. And it was a real big pass pass area. And the reason the tanks were up there, they could fire on any any incoming unit coming down toward that river fork. I mean, the tanks had clear firing range all over the place. Okay. But also, they had to be dug in. Yeah. They, they were dug in about two, two and a half feet down okay. in the ground. Huh? So they would be depolated. Okay. And they had a count, uh, over, overhead uh, camouflage. Okay. But we didn't have anybody fire at us we knew of because the ceasefire had just come in before oh, I got okay. there. And then when they had the prisoner release, that was another flap going on. Because when they had the prisoner release, these planes were flying overhead during the day, back and forth. Megs here and F-86s going huh. across and back and forth. And we thought they were going to have an air fight up there, but that didn't happen. But at night, a few people were nervous and they shot flares up a lot. <laughs> Firing flares up at night. Okay. But we didn't hear any any gunfire at all. So anyway, after that things settled down. We had anti aircraft be men right behind us. They had anti -air aircraft weapons. Quad fifties you know, like this. Yeah. Yeah. They were behind us so they didn't ever do much of anything except okay. uh, fix the machine gun up or 
yeah. take care of whatever. When we had an inspection, they were always asleep in the tent. <laughs> <laughs> they wouldn't wake up. We didn't understand that, but once once this once this situation up in the front settled down, they took the 25th Division, went to the rear, and the 7th Division came up to the front. And so by March, we were down in uh, Tongdichon on the level ground uh -huh. in a camp. It was a... You say you were in... Railhead Center. You were so in... We, it's China, did you say? Tong Du Chan is the name of this town. Oh, I, okay, I misunderstood. Tong, Tong Du Chan, okay. Korean name, but we call it a certain name camp, whatever yeah. the name was, I can't think of. So this was south of where you yeah, had been? It was been. south about uh, three and a half miles, okay. four, four miles, okay. I'd say. We went back in trucks, and we were there in March, and after we got there, we sold company by company, and our, and our tanks were all lined up in a company and we were behind a wire fence and uh, I took my platoon on some maneuvers because we could go out on the field yeah. down there but yeah. up on the mountaintop you couldn't go anywhere. Yeah. And we got the engines going and went out and took five, three to five out at a time, no more than. We could take about three out at a time okay. and they'd come back and some more would go out. But it, it got us a little bit out of the deep hole we were in up on that front. Yeah. You couldn't go anywhere up on that front. Now, I just want to be sure that uh, the, the record that you're you're making right now of, of what you did gives people a perspective of exactly where you were. You say you were 4,000 uh, 4, 4, yards. yards from the enemy. Was the enemy at the DMZ, or were they the south? Enemy, the enemy was on the opposite side okay. from our DMZ. I got our you. Our DMZ line had wire fence all the way across. So you were pretty much all the DMZ, or you were very we were right close? Right at the, below us, down to the bottom of the hill, with these wire fences, okay. barbed wire. And it was guarded ah. by patrols that were on foot. About, on both sides? Well, on the outside. On I don't our know side. what the other side was doing because you'd have to have a BC scope to see 4,000 okay. yards. But okay. we'd see them playing volleyball from up <laughs> high mountaintops. You really? could look down on the BC scope. Huh. That's the only way you could see yeah. it. Yeah. But I didn't know what they were doing. But we didn't. We didn't even have any idea what they were doing. Some kind of patrolling. Okay. Or playing ball or whatever. But on our side, it was. It was sort of a nowhere to go place. Yeah. I mean, you just had to be there. Yeah. And so when we got down into a, what we call a flat terrain, then they had more, uh, we had more ability to maneuver around. Right. And that was in that camp. Uh, we, we called it uh, Casey. But that's their American name for it. Yeah, okay. And uh, so anyway, after we got settled down there, they told me I had a new assignment. I said, what's that? Well, you're going to run the NCO Academy. I said, I am? I said, why is that? They said, well, we picked you out. I said, thank you very much. <laughs> I'll have to go scrounge up some people to work there, too. I said, if you think I'm going to do it by myself? They said, no, you don't have to do it by yourself. And so I got some men. I went out and asked around. Which, which sergeant or corporal had a college degree, and I got a few hands, and I said, let me ask you if you'd like to work in the NCO Academy. And I got five of them. Oh, wow. So I was lucky there, and I, we, we got them all together, and I assembled them, and we went over our lesson plans, and we wrote out our maps, and we had to make a, put a triangular stand out there, and we were in a Quonset building. We had to make stands to put our maps on and show things on And uh, we got a few of them that already knew how to do map reading. Of course they knew that, but I mean, we had to teach some about uh, firing and maneuvering. That took another man to know how to do that. He'd already been in combat. But yeah. It was a lot of lessons learned by me, as well as the teachers, the instructors, 
we all had to round up each other and, and divide time up with each other to see if we were doing what we were supposed to do. I said, I want you to do what we call a check out on me. I'll go up there and I'll give a class and you tell me what you think about it. So we did that and got that done once we got the wheels rolling. Okay. <laughs> so then after that, they put another lieutenant in charge and I went back to the company and then they put another one in charge and I went back to the company. So by that time, we'd been in the area where we were situated in that camp, Casey, about almost three months. And so the next thing I heard, the division is going to Hawaii. And so they said, everybody get ready to leave. Pack up your bags. All who want us to go to Hawaii have to sign a, a roster. And the company commander said, do you want to go to Hawaii? I said, that'd be fun. <laughs> he said, you can only stay but one year. That's all you have to be there. I said, I'm not signing. I'm going back to USA. <laughs> so I got transferred to a division. 24th Infantry Division, 21st Regiment, Tank Company. Okay. I stayed there practically two months, maybe six weeks, and I was told that 20, 24th Infantry Division was going to leave, going to Washington State. And I said, well, I get to go somewhere else. Where is that? They said, you go to 8th Army Headquarters. I said, that's fine with me. <laughs> I went to Seoul. By air, they took me down on a L-23 airplane and hold a little five people. So I got a ride down to Seoul and got down to 8th Army and I got to live in a brick building <laughs> for about two wow. weeks. And then a captain and I were assigned to the facilities maintenance. So we got a house, we were lucky. <laughs> Small wow. house wow. built by the Japan soldiers who were there <laughs> occupying. And so uh, what happened is we got to live there practically five weeks and here came two majors and drove us out. We had to go to, I got a separate little uh, tropical palace that had insulation on it. It was a canvas, uh, I guess they call it a cold and hot weather type of uh, billet. It was all right. Yeah. And, uh, we had a mess hall within 100 feet of where we were living. Yeah. So I did that duty until I did December and January until the 15th of February of 55. Okay. And then I was given my orders to return to the States. Okay, yeah, the war was over by then, right? Well, the war was already over. Yeah. The war was over since. Uh, August, the ceasefire came August of 53. Yeah. But I was there from late 53 until February of 55 okay. in Korea. Okay. Let me ask you a couple of questions going back a little bit in your okay. story. Yeah. Before you left the United States to, come, to go to Korea, what, what was the mood of the country? And of your friends about the Korean War, what was the discussion about? A lot of them didn't even know what was going on in Korea. They said, yeah. what is Korea for? What are they doing? I said, they were over there defending themselves from communism. Yeah. And I said, the only thing I know about is that the Soviet Union was taking part of North Korea to use for a exploitation of the South End with the North Korean people. They had tanks, they had weapons, they had all kinds of uh, munitions given to them by the uh, Soviet Union. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't know too much about that, but one of our members was given the duty of living on an island right off North Korea for espionage huh. and attacking North Koreans, uh, what we call uh, power lines, yeah. railroad lines, yeah. and all that, in secret. And I said, how'd you get that assignment? He said, I don't know. He said, they sent me to that island and told me I was in charge of huh. attacking the North Koreans at night or in secret. And I said, I'm glad you were lucky. 
<laughs> I don't I don't know anybody that did that. Yeah. And it was never told to us until yeah. maybe fifteen to twenty no, twenty years later we heard about it. Wow. And that man is in our chapter. Really? Yeah, ben Malcolm, he used to be commander of Fort MacPherson. He was a North Georgia graduate. North Georgia military. Gosh. But he was, he was, nobody knew about him until he published his book called The White Tigers. Oh, okay. Did you have any contact with civilians while you were in Korea to any extent? A few. Well, when I was facility, when I went to the facility management jobs I had at 8th Army, I had to hire contractors. Okay. I had to go out and find some of them. I said, I had to have a plumbing contract, I had to have a a uh, person that did, uh, um, we had to get someone who could do roofing because there were a lot of uh, billets that built by Japanese that got old and they leaked uh -huh. on top of some of our officers who were on duty. Yeah. So we had to find people that could do plumbing, roofing. We had about 15 cleaning women, we call them mama sons. Yeah. They were with buckets and mops and everything. They go cleaning everything. But uh, one of the big problems we had was ice. We had ice in the winter from leaks in uh, the water lines like the fire hydrants. They leak and turn into a big statue oh, of ice. Yeah, yeah. So <laughs> one gentleman stopped in our office one morning and said, did you know you got some ice out there? He said, looks like a new statue. I said, yes sir. I said, the only thing we know, it happened overnight. <laughs> he, he said, he was laughing at us. He said, well, I guess you're going to have to melt that down, aren't you? I said, I hope the sun comes out so it will melt. <laughs> he was funny. Now, this was less than 10 years after World War II ended. What was the attitude of the civilians that you got to know about what was going on? Well, in the 50s, a lot, of the, uh, a lot of the Korean people had established some form of business, and there were a lot of them out there looking for jobs like landscaping or, or mowing grass or uh, sweeping and whatever they could find. Yeah. We had a lot of them come by and ask if we had any jobs. Okay. And I said, well, my foreman's over here, and he's the only one who can hire people because I can't speak your language. Yeah. And uh, he would. He would say if he needed some help, he'd go hunt for a carpenter or he'd hunt for a plumber or somebody who knew to uh, do painting or whatever. Yeah. And if so, then they could get paid by U.S. government in yuan, okay. which is Korean yeah. money. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But I don't remember how much money they made. I don't think they made a whole lot of money. Yeah. I mean, they may probably made like thirty dollars a week or something yeah. like that. I, yeah, it was like. We had a big stack of money compared to our money. Yeah, yeah. They were like about three hundred or sixty-one to a dollar. <laughs> so I don't know much about that. You brought a book with you that has some pictures that are interesting, and one picture in particular involving a yeah. famous movie actress that you got to see, and you yes. actually took the picture. Would you yes. show us that? Yes. I will once I open it. Here it is somewhere. Here's a picture of a lady I took a picture of at the company I was in. That was where I was on duty. And she came by our company when she appeared. You can just sit down and hold it up. Yeah, you can sit down and just no, okay. sit down. hold it up there. She came by our company in this Jeep. Okay. And hold she, put a, she put her hand up and said, Does anybody. Anybody in your group come from Texas? A whole bunch of hands went up. Next question, anybody come from California? No hands. <laughs> <laughs> and who was this lady? Her name was Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> I think we've heard of her. Yeah, she was very pleasant and uh, seemed to think we were having a good day, so yeah. we agreed. You know, we waved at her and all that, and then she took off on the Jeep to wherever she was going. Would you read what's at the bottom of that picture, too? Because it's, I believe it's... It's 
This is Marilyn Monroe at Tank Company, 35th Infantry Regiment, 25th U.S. Infantry Division, March 1954. Okay. Photo by Thomas Harris. That's you. <laughs> and there's one other picture of, I believe, some USO performances that. Yep. Uh, that's some more. I've got Bart there. There's some more of his. There's some more pictures. Okay. This one on the left is Betty Hutton, who was performing with some other actresses, such as. Okay. Maybe they were nurses, I don't know. And then over here is another lady. Had a big show with a division. I don't know what division it said here. In 1952, that was near the main line of resistance. They call it MLR front. And then down here, here's another show. Okay, that's good. Thank you. I imagine that was good for the morale, wasn't it? Yeah, it was good. Good for the morale because sometimes uh, people were rather, uh, I'd say, bored quite well if they were, if they didn't have any activity going on. Then sometimes there would be a show brought in, and there was another show that I don't have any photograph of. But Slapsy Maxie Rosenblum brought a show in from New York, huh. and they did, <laughs> they did a funny act. Oh, God. It was so funny. They did a funny act about it. Romeo and Juliet <laughs> in comedy. <laughs> but it was rather fun. It was really funny. In general, what was the morale like among the U.S. troops when you were there? And I know you had different assignments. Well, but when I got to Korea, the morale wasn't so hot. I mean, a lot of men said they were just bored to death. They said, we don't know what's going on out here because of the fact that the activity of being in defense was just nominal because there was no firing allowed after the ceasefire. And so they were saying, where is that position to be? And I said, you're right at it. They said, well, isn't this ridiculous? We don't have any jobs to do. I said, well, we got some jobs to do on tanks. We got plenty of jobs. Do you want to work? I said, we can clean them up put the oil on them and, and do that. And I said, more than that, we can tell each other a good a good uh, information story about what's good about where you live. Yeah. But well, I guess bored. there was oil. They were bored because the ceasefire was in effect. The ceasefire made people just yeah. stale. Let's put it in that term. They were like, this is boring as all get out. Yeah. We don't know what's next. <laughs> was there any concern among your troops and the officers in your unit that the communists would attack even though there was a ceasefire? Well, uh, I can't tell what the S2 is always worried about. Something would happen in the middle of the night and all that. But I never did get up into the scale of saying what is our maneuver in case of a major emergency like some bombers came over or somebody yeah. fired on uh, the across the DMZ? Yeah. I said, well, the UN is in, supposed to be in charge of where the enemies stay, including our side and their side. And I said, I hope none of them break open in the middle of the night and decide to start another war. Yeah. yeah. But they said, well, they were concerned and they didn't know what was be in the other right. side's uh, secret uh, yeah. plans, but I didn't know anything. Yeah. But what I did, I finally said, well, I'm going to breathe some fresh air when I get out of this point up here in the front, and I'll get back in the rear. Yeah. When did you leave Korea? I left on the 15th of February, 1955. Okay. And I went on a ship, and it was a uh, MSTS, Marine Ship Transport, uh, um, by, hired by the U.S. government. It yeah. wasn't a, a Navy ship, it yeah. was a U.S. Marine Service done by civilians. I mean, a civilian captain, but he was formerly a naval man, uh, a Coast Guard man, or whatever, I don't know. 
that we went across the North Pacific from Incheon out past Japan. We went past Japan straight up to the to the Arctic Sea and went over and all the way north and then went south to San Francisco. Okay. I got to San Francisco at my last time on a ship. Okay. And, uh, my sister was standing on the deck, uh -huh. on the landing, uh, port oh. landing. Did you know she was going to be there? Well, she knew I was coming, but I didn't know where she would be. Yeah. She lived down uh, 20 miles south of San Francisco, okay. in uh, San Mateo. Okay. And uh, she, was, she was nice to be there, and I was glad to see her. Yeah. And I said, i got to get my feet on the land over here. I'm going to get on there. <laughs> she said, well, we got a ride in a car. I said, let's go. <laughs> but due to the change in uh, time, I didn't know what time it was because we were 8,000 miles apart. I said, what time is it? I said, I'm real sleepy. She says, it's only 2 o'clock in the day. I said, well, I'm, I'm supposed to be asleep at this time of day, am I not? She said, you must be thinking of night. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, I got to ride to her house and I met her husband and uh, daughter and son. They were oh, young. Good. They were good. young kids then. I mean, they were like, at night, I guess they were like about 10 years old or something. Okay. Not more. They were between 7 and 10. Yeah. They were kids. Huh. It was kind of nice. I mean, I got to go back to San Francisco and I spent couple of days going around through San Francisco. Good. Went shopping, went into a couple of places where they served good drinks and had some good food to eat. Saw a lot of beautiful areas there. I mean, it was nice. Sounds like a good way to get back into the country. Yeah, well, I felt like the next thing I'm going to do is go get some new clothes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have any civilian clothes with me at all. Zero. But, uh, could bash on them, you know. Yeah. So I, I bought a couple of T-shirts and uh, I don't know what else. I probably uh, probably bought a nail file or some stuff to take home. I had to go by air, you know. Yeah. They gave me an air ticket when I got to uh, the port. Okay. At uh, I guess they call it Presidio. Yeah. We port come in a port. Right. And uh, they arranged to give me an air ticket, so I knew when I could get a plane out. Okay. And I went back and went to Chicago. The plane stopped in Chicago and said, well, you got to get on another plane tomorrow. I said, well, I had to spend the whole night in Chicago. That didn't hurt me at all. I went downtown <laughs> and went around the loop. Yep. And a gentleman saw me getting off the bus. He said, you just come back from Korea? I said, yes. He said, well, I'll take you out to eat. I said, take wow. me with you then. <laughs> How about that? I said, I'd rather go out to eat somewhere rather than a mess hall. Yeah. Well, that made you feel good to be treated like that, didn't it? Sure did. Yeah, it made me feel better about USA. I said, I'm back home again. I don't know what to say. Yeah. Well, what did you do from that point forward? Well, I went back to Atlanta, and uh, of course, I saw my family after I got on the ground and everything. But I, my dad was at that time I got back. He was around 75. I think he's right at 75 or so. But he didn't like to drive much. But I told him, I said, we'll, we'll go anywhere you want to go, but I'll do driving for you. You don't have to drive me. But he was totally ready to retire. He hadn't retired. He owned his own business. And uh, I wanted to meet some of my family. My brothers, two of them, and one brother had a wife there, and the other one uh, was in a hospital or something, but she got back out, and uh, I saw my nieces and nephews, and then I went to Albany, where my brother-in-law had just left Korea, and where he was back in dentistry, and I wanted to go down there and see him again, and he and my dad had purchased a farm, and I got to go out and look at the farm, and walk around. Huh. It was sort of a visit. Yeah. I didn't want to be a farmer though. I mean, right. I just wanted to look and yeah. wait to get back to Atlanta and then I was looking to find what kind of work I was going to do and I got approached by different people. 
say, do you want to be an insurance salesman? I said, I don't know if I want to be an insurance salesman or not. I don't know yet. I said, I'm going to have to look around a little bit. But what I did finally, I went back to Georgia State and worked on my master's degree oh, God. for about a year. And then I said, no more of this. I said, enough is enough. <laughs> yeah, then I was went to work as a contractor's estimator okay. for a while. I think possibly till 68 or 9, I guess. Probably about. Probably I was in that business for about six or seven years, and then I got to be a salesman for a manufacturing company, and I liked that better. Okay. Uh, yeah. The last job I had was working with Republic Powdered Metals, in, who's in uh, the out of Cleveland, Ohio, and this was a total commission job, but I had in North Georgia the whole thing. Wow. But I had to go to work. <laughs> Did you ever have any reunions with uh Troops that were in your units? Reunions, I went to a couple in Washington, okay. but uh, there weren't but a few from my own regiment. I mean, I met a lot from 25th Infantry, but from the 35th Cacti Regiment, I met two guys at Washington when we were getting ready to celebrate Korean. Uh, building a memorial, yeah. but this was before the memorial. Yeah. Uh, two guys, one of them was uh, in the tank company, same platoon I was in before I got there. And his name Jack, and he lived in Maryland. And Jack said, when did you get there? I told him I got there in uh, January of 1954 to start in the company, and he said, well, I had just left. <laughs> That's unusual, but he'd been in the same platoon that I took on. But I'd seen him many more times. Yeah. But uh, I stayed in the Army Reserve for 18 years. Oh, good. Congratulations. <laughs> you mentioned prior to the interview that you learned a lot from General Davis. Would you talk, well, number one, tell us who General Davis okay, is and what this, you learned? How I got into that was that I had gotten a good bit of communications from people who were beginning to start the Korean War veterans back in the 80s. This was about 86, 7, or middle 80s. And a man from New York, Bill Norris, sent out these letters and he kept saying, do you want to be a member of the Korean War veterans? And I wrote back and I said, yes, I'd like to. Send, a, send me the mail and tell me what. So by 89, I gathered up some men I found were Korean War veterans. And we had a meeting at Highland Mill Road at the Holiday Inn in October of 1989. And we got 30 people to come to it. <laughs> Mr. Sobieski, who was a retired colonel, and I had the first meeting. And we had 30 attend that meeting. And I said, we've done some good here. We can get this thing started. And I said, do you want to be the president? He said, well, it doesn't matter. We'd get somebody to be the president. And I said, well, look, let's get on the, let's get on the, uh, list of people who were Korean War veterans and asked any of them who could come to a meeting. Then we had another meeting later than that, I think it was about maybe December or somewhere around January of 90. We got in touch with General Davis and here he came. And I guarantee they showed up at that meeting. We had about 10 people said they want to join that day and paid their dues. For the record, would you explain who General Davis Well, General Raymond was. Davis was a graduate of Georgia Tech in 1939. <coughs> he had an Army commission, and he said he's ready to report to the Army, he said. And he told us that he went to the U.S. Army and said, I'm reporting for duty, and they said, well, we don't have any positions to open. We're sorry, we don't have anything for you. He said, well, what else? They said, well, uh, 
there may be something coming up later. And he said, I'm resigning right now. He said he went straight to the Marine Corps, and they took him in within one more day. <laughs> <laughs> so he became a Marine and uh, went to Paris Island or wherever it was he went to and became a officer in World War II. Then after that he became famous from his time in the Pacific. But he then went into Korea in the fall of 1950. Did a magnificent job of getting troops out of a hole they were in up in the Chosin Reservoir. And uh, after that, I think he was a lieutenant colonel then, and it wasn't too long he got promoted to, promote to general, and uh, President Truman gave him the Congressional Medal in 1952, I think. And uh, we found out about him through the Marines, yeah. the Marine members. And next thing, when he came to a meeting, they showed up. They came. <laughs> A lot of Marines came. Good. But Army men and Air Force and all of them came. Good. So we had, he was a great person to have for a leader. And of course, we unanimously elected him to be the president. Yeah. <laughs> Good decision. <laughs> yeah. So I stood in as his secretary for about seven okay. years. And I said, I'm a volunteer. That's all there is to it. Tony, do you have any questions? No, I don't. You know, before we finish, I want to give you a chance to just say anything else you want to say, either well, filling in from your story or any message you want to give. What I can say is this. I'm not trying to I'm not trying to put any gilding on this, but I do know that some of the men that I've met in this group of veterans are some of the finest men I've ever met in my whole life. I'm not talking about just normally having friends that you grew up with. These men are just like brothers to me. Yeah. And uh, I've been on trips with them to reunions. I've been on other places like we go to the cemetery up uh -huh. in Canton, Georgia. Yeah. We've gone to other places for uh, uh, commemorating if someone has passed away. Yeah. But I guarantee this, uh, we're, we're pretty thick in uh, comrade Good. Comradery is Good. what I mean to say. Well, I know they feel the same way about you. And, uh, well, I, I have uh, I've gained a lot by knowing some of these men because they knew things about the military that I never had heard about, especially some of their experiences. Because, uh, like Sobieski, he was given a uh, silver star for being in a command position out there. Wow. And uh, he had a company when he was first lieutenant. Wow. And I guarantee, I said, that was a job you had. He said they were being harassed by Chinese, and one of the uh, snipers got him on the wrist and where his watch had reflected. And he got wounded in the wrist, but he was lucky. But he had yeah. two lieutenants that were killed by snipers. Wow. I said, that's pretty tough going. You yeah. Know? Well, I want to thank you again for coming in here. I mean, yeah. you've got a really interesting story. And yeah. I want to thank you for your, your military service, particularly your duty in Korea. Well, and you've had a, an interesting life. You continue yeah. to have an interesting life. Well, I didn't want to. Say I wouldn't go, but I was glad to be through with my military when Vietnam broke out. I could not understand about Vietnam, to be honest. I could not understand it. I mean, I had a hard time covering what reason we had to go there, because it looked to me like they were having a civil war over there between two different types of uh, religions or parties or whatever. And I did not understand until later in after this thing had been going on, so yeah. long, and people came back. I said, do you think we accomplished a lot there? And they said, yes, we, we accomplished a lot by getting out. When, when Nixon tried to keep it going, he said it was useless. Well, I guess it's like a lot of wars, you never know the reason until 
it's over, and then you understand why we were there. Yeah. That's true. I met a, I met a man who was a seal over there, and he he helped rescue a man. They were there trying to find out about the North Vietnamese camps. They sneaked in there. It was supposed to be picked up by a submarine, and they got they were sighted, and the fellow he was with got shot right here and he lost his eye. Yeah. This man took him out on the water and kept him on his shoulders for one hour swimming. Jeez. I said, I've never known anybody did that before. That's a courageous man. They got a submarine finally, but the submarine came late. They said that they had to give a signal or something yeah. and they had to come in through the water with a periscope. Yeah. You know, wow. they, they were rescued. Anyway, well, it's been interesting. Well, thank you again for coming, but also thank you for your service, and it's a, been an honor to hear your story. Well, I was glad to be there. You know, another thing, when I got back, some of my friends said, well, how long were you on vacation? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, it was a short vacation, but it was a, longer than I thought. Yeah. <laughs> I said, the vacation's over. Yeah. <laughs>